the book of 1 Timothy. So if you take your Bibles and open to 1 Timothy. And we're in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Today is going to be, uh, we're going to look at verse 10. Um, but let's read verse 8 through verse 13 as we begin. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons must be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So last week, our brother Dave, um, who did a wonderful job in uh, bringing the scriptures, uh, he reminded us that the real uh, that in the New Testament they would not have read the word deacons when they were reading this passage they would have read the word servant because the word our word deacon actually is a transliteration from the Greek and the word Greek is and the word in the Greek is just servant it's not deacon it's servant so uh, we call them deacons but we could just as accurately call them servants of the church. And if you think of it that way, it's not surprising that God says that they are going to receive good standing for themselves because Christ said that in his kingdom, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, right? So if you are a servant of the church, you would acquire good standing, right? right? Do you have to be labeled as a servant of the church to serve the church? No. But this is a reference, this, the, the point of this passage is for those who are, are recognized by the church as the servants of the church, it is a good place to be in God's kingdom. So Dave covered verses 8 and 9 um, on the uh, expectations of, of the deacon, uh, of the servant, and he said that the summation was that the, uh, the servant of the church must point people to Christ. Right? So your life and your pattern of behavior must point people to Christ. And if you go to verse 10, it says they must also be tested first. And if they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Well, this idea, what is it? What is it what, they must be tested Is that like you sit down with a Scantron and and fill in the 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 bubbles, right? If you've ever done that and you don't know what you're testing, it's fun to make a little uh, pattern out of the bubbles, you know. Uh, Of course, I've never had that happen in my life, but I've heard stories of that happening to others. (laughs) Yeah, of course that's happened to me. But anyway, um, that's not the kind of test that they're they're talking about here. Uh, there's also the type of tests where, you know, you have, um, we call them life tests, I guess, if you want to say that, you know, as you uh, take on responsibility in life where you, you, uh, you know, when you, when you grow up and you move out of your, of your fam- parents' household and you're responsible for all your own bills for the first time, right, that's a test, Right. Um, and if you have loving parents, um, it's, uh, it's not as if you fail, you're in big trouble. But, you know, sometimes you can fail and be in big trouble because you've got nothing to fall back on. But um, there are different types of tests. This, this testing is not really um, those type of tests. Uh, if the, the, the word tested here means to test, to examine, to try to, 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 try to determine the genuineness of. Let me say that again, to try to determine the genuineness of. So I I looked up comparable passages of Scripture that use the same word here, testing. So I'd like to read some of those for you. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3.13, says, Each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test, same word there, will test, the quality of each one's work. Right, so here we have the testing by fire that's referenced in Corinthians, which is, you know, are you going to 
build a, a, a wood, hay, and stubble from your works, or gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, by the way, quick side note, can preach on this later, but I believe when you compare that with the rest of Scripture, that God's not talking about your actions. He's talking about the love uh, that you show through your actions when he talks about doing wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, but we can get into that later. But here, that, I, that fire that will test the quality of your work is the same testing that's given to deacons here. Well, this is, a test, this is God's test. This is God's fire that's testing the works, right? Right, so it is God doing the testing. Now, if you look at Romans 2, um, I'm going to read the whole passage here of 17 to 24. It says, Now, if you call yourself a Jew and, and rest in the law, boast in God, know his will, and approve things that are superior, being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the full expression of knowledge and truth in the law, then you who teach another, don't you teach yourself. You, pre you who preach, you must not steal, do you steal. You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery. You who detest idols, do you rob their temples. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So this passage in Romans is where Paul is saying to the very religious Jews, if you say that your religion is all that, but you still find yourself breaking the law, what does that really say about you and your great religion that you say you have perfectly put together? But the word approve the things that are superior. So you say you know his will and approve the things that are superior. All right, that's the same word as tested or testing, right? So this here has to do with the life experience that would teach someone what it is that God's really after, right? And if you're, if you're a great religious person, you should have some life testing to show you what matters to God. Doesn't mean you can keep it. Doesn't mean that you can maintain it. Doesn't mean that you're going to be flawless at it. You see, Paul's point is not that this is bad, but that this is not what God is after. God is after your faith. But if you're able to approve things that are superior, that is a, a good thing, right? We would consider that a positive thing. And this has to do with your experience in life serving the Lord that teaches you what is important to God. Uh, verse 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven to 29 says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself. That should examine is the same word for testing. So should examine himself. In this way, he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That idea of examining yourself, that you should examine, is the same as testing. Right? How do you know that you know you love God and that you're committed to Him and to serving His body? Well, it comes through testing. It comes through examination. Uh, Luke 12, 54-56 says, When you see a cloud rising in the west... Right away you say, a storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be a scorcher, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the, the appearance of the, sky, the earth and the sky, but you don't know how to interpret this time. The words there, to interpret, are the same word as tested or testing. All right, so here you have the Pharisees who Christ is attacking for their ability to recognize problems coming on the earth, trials and tests that come. They see the wind or the cloud rising in the west. They see a storm's coming, something that's going to be a problem. They see a south wind, and they say, wow, this is going to be such a hot day. And they're right because their experience tells them they're right. But when they're face-to-face -face with what's important to God, they're clueless. 
He says, you're hypocrites. You need to understand how to interpret, to have that testing done and recognize what it is. So this testing that God references here in 1 Timothy 3 for deacons is a testing that enables them to understand what's important to God. You say, well, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, let me, let, me, let me break it down rather simply here. Uh, when you're young, your goal is to fix the problems so the problems go away, right? When you're young, that's your thinking. I can fix this. I can make it disappear. It can all be good, right? Uh, as you get older, you start to recognize I can't fix all the problems. I can't make them go away. So, so what does that teach you if you're learning properly? Well, it teaches you that there are things that are important and there are some things that are less important. right? And when you can't make the problem go away, you try to do your best to improve the things that are important and not waste your time on the things that are less important. So as it is, so it is in knowing the Lord and, and, and serving in the body, you know, fixing people in the long run is not what's most important. And when you're when you're when you're when you're newly saved and you you, you see how God and the Holy Spirit has fixed so much within you, you think that others are going to be fixed if they just listen to what God's taught you. Right? And so in your exuberance, you try and fix everything in the church. And as you're tested through this, you start to realize, maybe God didn't call me to fix everybody's problem in the church. <laughs> so then you start to, if you're learning through the Spirit, you start to recognize that which is important and that which needs to be prioritized within the church. And as you grow in that maturity, you start to recognize, you know what? It's really not about fixing their problem. It's about pointing them back to God's love for them and who they are in Christ. You see, God's love for us and his forgiveness of our sin actually fixes all of our problem. But I can't make somebody recognize that. I can preach it until I'm blue in the face. I can preach until I have no voice left to say something. But I can't make somebody believe that God's love and forgiveness actually fixes their problem. But I can point them to it knowing that that's the only real hope they have. And knowing that just because it fixes, it doesn't mean the problem's going to go away. It doesn't mean that you're never going to deal with that problem. It just provides hope and security and direction. You say, what kind of direction are you talking about? Well, the direction that brings praise to Christ. You say, God, because of your love, because of your forgiveness, I can praise you in the middle of my personal prison. I can praise you in the middle of my personal failure. I can praise you in the middle of whatever it is that I'm suffering through because, God, your love and forgiveness have raised me out of this. Not because I don't experience it anymore, but because that's not who I am in you. That's not how you see me. i tell you this story about the first time in my life that I committed a sin you know, you know how those moments you commit a sin, you know it was a sin, you knew it ahead of time, but you did it anyway because you're being selfish. You probably never have that, but I do on occasion, right? And I had that moment, and you know what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit reminded me of Scripture in the middle of that moment that said, Steve, the Holy Spirit reminded me, Steve, God has removed this sin from you as far as the east is from the west, And for the first time in my life, I realized I don't have to repent. Sorry, excuse me. I don't have to say I'm sorry to feel close to God because he's already removed it from me. 
I'm not saying that you can't or that you shouldn't. I'm just saying you don't have to because if you're in Christ and his promises are real, then he's removed all of your sin from you, even the one you just committed intentionally in your arrogance. He's removed that from you so that when he looks at you in the middle of your sin, he sees Christ. After all, if you didn't need Christ because of sin, then you wouldn't need him in the middle of your sin. But because you need him because of your sin, you need him in the middle of your sin. And when God looks at you in your sin, he sees Christ. And that realization turned my, my guilt and my frustration at myself into a praise hallelujah service. Where in my spirit, I just started singing and saying, wow, God, you're awesome. And it gave me the freedom the next time to say, you know what, I don't have to feel guilty about that sin, which means I don't have to deal with that part of the temptation. I don't have to deal with the fact that I've been a failure and I, I'm, I'm regularly a failure because God doesn't see a failure. He sees Christ. And so when you have gone through testing and you recognize what's important to God and you serve the body effectively, the body is effectively pointed back to Christ. But that only happens through testing. It doesn't happen through teaching. You could hear this sermon, you could acknowledge and assent to say, yes, I agree with that, and it's so true, and then without testing, you go out, and immediately you're ready to fix a problem for somebody. Right? They call you, you get a text on your phone as you're driving home, and of course you don't read it because we don't do that, but you read it when you get home, right? And uh, suddenly someone's got a problem, and your knee-jerk reaction is, I've got to fix it for them. Because it's through testing that you learn, wait a minute, I've tried that before. And it failed epically. <laughs> and in the end, nobody was really helped by all of my great fixing. So, Lord, how do you want me to love them through this and point them to your love and to who you are? But then he says that they must be tested, and if they prove blame, blameless, they can serve as deacons. Well, that just disqualified everybody here. Have a good day. <laughs> We're closing the church doors. Not a single one of us is qualified to be a deacon or to serve the church. Because not a single one of us is truly blameless, right? Right? But the reality is the word actually doesn't mean that you're flawless or perfect. It means that you're without accusation. So what does it mean to be without accusation? Well, let's read a couple of scriptures that highlight some of this truth for us. These scriptures all actually use the word blameless, so you'll see right where it fits in, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9 says, I, thank my, I, thank, I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus, that by him you were enriched in everything, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful you were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So who is responsible for this blameless in 1 Corinthians? Christ is. He will strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless. That blamelessness is not your works of righteousness. It is the, it is the covering in the blood of Christ that he and his blood strengthen you right now so that when you stand before God, you will be blameless, not because of your actions, but because of his work. Colossians 1, 21 through 22 it says, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds uh, uh, because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So who is responsible for this blamelessness? Christ. Christ is responsible. So the only other time that this word blameless is used in the New Testament is in Titus 1, 
5 through 9, where um, Paul is summarizing what he wrote to Timothy about elders um, being blameless. Right? He says, This reason I left you in Crete, I'm sorry, the reason I left you in Crete was to, was to set right what was undone, and as I direct, directed you to appoint elders in every town, one who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of wildness or rebellion, for an overseer as God's administrator must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the message, the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. So this blamelessness as applying to a elder, um, an overseer, how can any one of us actually be blameless? Well, on our own, it's really impossible. You see, this whole list is a work of the Spirit. So this whole responsibility about blamelessness is a work of the Spirit. So what does it mean to be without accusation in the work of the Spirit? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I was waiting for that question. No. The, the, uh, be, being without accusation in the work of the Spirit means that the Spirit has clearly been at work in you so that those who know you know that when the fire is turned on in your life, you respond to the instruction and sometimes correction of the Holy Spirit. You see, nobody around you in the Christian world or outside the Christian world, nobody around you expects you to actually be flawless if you follow God. But what they do expect is that you submit to what God says is important when you fail. They expect that you submit to what God says is His expectation when the Spirit leads you. Right? So when you, when you have those moments and the Spirit leads you and you follow that leading and you don't actually have a failure, and, but the reality is everybody knows that was God working through you. That was not you. Well, you just came out blameless, but it was because of God at work. And everybody who knows you knows that. But then you have those moments when everybody who knows you also knows, yeah, well, that's Steve for you. <laughs> it's how he's always responded to those. You know, for me personally, you know what, you know what really agitates me? You're going you're gonna to like this because now you can do this when you, when you want to agitate me. What really agitates me is when you have absolutely no plan and then somebody just goes, hey, we should all do this. Why? Why should we all do that? Because you thought it was a good idea? What if I didn't want to? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And you're like, wait, there's no discussion here? What's going on? Do I have a vote? Do I have a say? Or am I just supposed to go along as if I really want to do that? Because I really don't most of the time. That aggravates me. It just it make, takes my anger and goes, whoop! And what I want to do is I want to stick my heels in the ground and go, you all go. I'm not going to. I didn't want to go in the first place. You know, the worst part is, <clears throat> that's how most of my wife and I, both my wife and I's families function when we're all together. It's like, what's the plan? I don't know. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. Well, what do we do? Why don't we do this? Yeah, that's a good idea. Wait a minute. We're doing it right now? Like, there's no plan, no, no direction? Like, I, I couldn't expect this? Like, couldn't you have given me, like, a, at least a couple hours notice? So my family has absolutely no issues with recognizing that when Steve gets a little upset because they all decide to do something, oh, that's just Steve. He's always been that way. Rachel's family is learning. Oh, that's just Steve. He's always been that way. But you know what? It's not my, it's not my reaction 
that points them to Christ. It's my follow my follow up to my reaction of am I going to submit to the Spirit? If I do sin in word or deed, do I acknowledge that I sin? Or do I just let it go because, well, pff, I decided to go anyway, even though it's a stupid idea, so you should be happy that I'm here. Or do I say, you know what? Sorry, guys, I had a little blow up. I was wrong. Shouldn't have blown up. Stupid of me. You forgive me? Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgive you, Steve. Okay, sure, no problem. But it's not a big deal. True, it's not. So why not submit to the Holy Spirit and look like Christ in it? Well, because that doesn't make me feel good. Well, thank God that he called you to salvation for you to feel good. Hope you can catch the sarcasm in that. You do feel good in salvation because your sins are forgiven. And because they're forgiven, it really shouldn't be a big deal to make something right. You're already forgiven. You don't need another human's permission to be forgiven. So why not just say, you know what? God's forgiven me. I know I was wrong. I'll ask you to forgive me. Why not? There's this little thing called pride. I n these three little words are the most horrifying and miserable words in the entire English language. Are you ready for these three little words? I was wrong. As a matter of fact, Rachel and I hate saying those words so much that we've made up a little, we, at times we have this little joke that we'll say to, to lighten the mood for having to say such painful little words. And the joke is, do I need to say all those words exactly? Of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> but it just lightens the mood. You see, this idea of being blameless is really about do you recognize who you are before God and allow others to see that through you? Or do you pretend to others that because you have God, you're good, you don't need anything from them, you don't need their forgiveness, you don't need their acceptance, you don't need to acknowledge anything because you and God got this and forget about everybody else and what they think of you. Well, some people think that way. That's just immature. It doesn't mean that you can't be saved. It doesn't mean that you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior or that you aren't trusting him by faith. It just means you're immature about the way you think. If that happens to be you and you're hearing this, I'm not picking on you, okay? I have plenty of moments of immaturity in my life, so I'm not trying to say that, oh, well, you're a bad person or that God's not going to use you. Just recognize it for what it is. It's immature. So God, grant me the faith and the strength to take steps towards spiritual maturity so that people around me will recognize that because of God's work in me, my life is blameless, not perfect. You see, if I acknowledge my faults and I ask for your forgiveness, you cannot accuse me of being an arrogant sinner within my faults. Now, there is one caveat to this, okay? And I try to teach this to my kids. Sorry does not equal I was wrong. Did you catch that? Sorry does not equal I was wrong. Because, frankly, we are sorrowful every time we look bad. And I can be very sorry that I look bad. That doesn't mean that I think I was wrong. Right? If I get caught, but I have no repentant heart, I don't think I was wrong. But I'll say sorry because I look bad. Sorry. Hope you think better of me now. I said sorry. You see, sorrowful is an emotion. Emotions can be good and God can use them. 
but only if they're submitted to Scripture and through the Holy Spirit. To be sorrowful for the way that I've sinned is in Christ, it's God's way of saying, Steve, you were wrong. You're an idiot. Oh, you got me pegged. <laughs> so am I willing to admit that? Or in my pride and in my foolishness, am I going to say, okay, thanks, God, and just leave it there? So in trying to teach this to my children, I have a story for you. Uh, one, of course, my children are never wrong, but on one occasion they happen to be. And uh, this time, this particular occasion, it was Stephen. And um, I don't even know if he remembers what it was. I don't remember what he was wrong over, but it was, he was wrong in the way that he treated Rachel. So I said to him, I said, Stephen, your punishment for this is you need to go and say to mommy these exact words. I was wrong, please forgive me. He was old enough to understand, and I knew he was, but you would have thought that I'd have beat that child within an inch of his life to get him to say those words. I didn't. But I mean, it was... <laughs> you couldn't even hardly hear him. He was just so, just so tore up for having to actually say, I was wrong. I say that to let you know, I don't think this is easy. I'm not suggesting that this is easier. No. But do you want for people around you to recognize that you are blameless before God? Well, this is how. This is how people recognize that you're blameless, blameless before God. Now, maybe you're, maybe you're here today and maybe you are a deacon or maybe you've been a deacon or maybe you've thought about being a deacon and maybe you say, you know what? Now, I, there's, there's one area or one person in my life I know this doesn't apply. This, I'm not doing this. I'm, just, I'm not in this. Maybe, maybe it's more than one. Maybe it's just one. But maybe just I know that this has not happened right there. Well, here's the truth. You can continue serving as a deacon and no one else will know that that's the case except for that one situation or individual. And every time that they think about you, they will think something to the effect of, if his church knew, if her church knew, they probably wouldn't want them to be a deacon. Why? Because that's what it means when you are with accusation. When someone can look at you and say, you just don't care about me or my life or anything because look at what you did and you never ever acknowledge your fault. So that, does, that, does that mean that you can't serve? No, it just means that you probably shouldn't. <laughs> and I'm not here to judge you and say that I know you shouldn't. I'm just saying that maybe you'd be wise to say, you know what, until I get this fixed, I'm, I'm going to do the, uh, the God-honoring thing and acknowledge that I'm not ready. <laughs> and I hope that, and as far as I know, and this is before God, as far as I know, this does describe our deacons here at First Baptist. So I'm not picking on anyone here. I'm not picking on anyone that, that you could be thinking of. I'm not thinking of anyone in specific. I'm just teaching through the Scripture. But if you know somebody who is up for deacon or has been suggested for deacon and you know that this does not apply to their life, you should, for the sake and for the health of the body, say, by the way, just want you to know, I don't think that this fits them. At least not today. Why? Because they're supposed to be blameless. Otherwise, the body will suffer shame from those who can point to that servant and say, there's a question in my mind whether or not they're actually a servant of the Lord because of what, what X, Y, or Z.
But there is hope. You see, all of us need the truth of God's word. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. There is hope, and herein lies the hope, okay? You see, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And the scripture says, against such, there is no law. You say, yeah, how do I get those? You need more of the Holy Spirit. You say, how do I get that? You know, Christ himself said, he said, if anyone asks for the Spirit, I will freely give. And give abundantly. So if you know that you have failures in your life, that you're not showing the fruit of the Spirit in one area, it's not about how disciplined you can be or how hard you can pull yourself up and fix it. It's about your willingness to say, God, I am an utter failure, and I haven't been doing this, and I can't do this, and I will never do this on my own. I need more of your Spirit to work through me so that somehow, in the middle of all of my failure, people around me can see you. And allow God's Spirit to bring out His fruit through you. And sometimes that'll mean that God leads you away from the temptation and you don't fall to the sin. And sometimes it means that God will allow you to do what you want to do so that His Spirit can remind you what repentance looks like. But either way, when you follow the leading of God's Spirit and people see that God's Spirit is leading you, they will be able to say, this person is without accusation. Because at least they're consistent in what they say about their God and who they're following. So next week we will look at, it says, the wives of deacons. Um... Uh, so we can come back for that uh, sermon next week, and it'll be, let's see, oh, the, the, the deacons at home. Um, by the way, I just want to thank God, and I've said this before, I want to thank God for this church. I thank God for the many people who are qualified already because you're doing the work of serving the church. You're already doing it, whether or not you're recognized as a deacon or deaconess, you are we, are, we also already have uh, faithful men who are functioning in the capacity as overseer. And uh, whether or not they're recognized for that, they're doing it anyway. And I thank God for that. And uh, I just want you to know that in teaching through this, I don't feel discouraged at First Baptist. I feel thoroughly encouraged that I get to serve God with you. Um, but if you have anything that you would like to bring to me about myself as a result of preaching through this, please do so uh, by God's grace and the leading of his spirit. Uh, uh, I will respond appropriately, but please don't hesitate to bring anything to my attention. Uh, or if you know of any of the spiritual leaders, you want to bring something to their attention, hopefully by God's grace, they will also respond appropriately. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, we thank you for the power of your truth. Lord, we thank you that you've given us instructions for both elders and for servants. Lord, I ask that you would give us the humility that we need to recognize how frail and failing we are apart from your Spirit working through us. Lord, that your Spirit would exalt your name through our um, body of believers. And uh, Lord, we just ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.